Not Quickly Broken, part three. And I hope you'll come back next week for the conclusion. And we'll really kind of unpack uh, why we called this series Not Quickly Broken. But Hebrews 12.1, I want to begin by reading this common passage, this, this well-known passage in an, uh, another translation, a fresh translation. It says, as for us, we have all of these great witnesses who encircle us like clouds. So we must let go of every wound that has pierced us and the sin we so easily fall into. Then we will be able to run life's marathon race with passion and determination. For the path has already been marked out before us. We look away from the natural realm and we fasten our gaze onto Jesus who birthed faith within us and who leads us forward into faith's perfection. You thankful for God's word? Anybody? I just, just feel a great sense of gratitude for it. I want to talk to you this weekend about fasting, a key to spiritual quickness. Fasting. What is it? I believe, among other things, it's a key to spiritual quickness. Jack B. Nimble, Jack B. We want to be spiritually quick. Why? Well, because one of the most common metaphors used in the New Testament to describe the Christian life is that of a race. And if we're running a race, we want to be ready, set, well, not slow. We want to go. We want to be quick. We want to be fast. We want to run this race with passion and endurance. And so we have a cloud of witnesses urging us on. You run better when you're watched than when you're alone. Yeah. You, you, you do differently when you know someone's there to see you. One of the most common refrains in our house right now is dada. Dada, watch, dada, look. I don't know, I don't know why he started calling me dada all of a sudden, but I, 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 I said Padre would be fine. Uh, but <laughs> dada, watch, dada, watch, wa dada, da dada, watch. What? He wants me to see him. We run faster when our parents are watching us. We run, we run faster when there's an audience. And so the author of the book of Hebrews says, in this race, that is life, this, this journey towards the prize, this journey towards a goal. We have witnesses that he says circle us. And of course, in the author's mind is the great Olympic stadium. In the author's mind is this, this running with, with, with the grandstands packed out to capacity with those who are urging us on. They have our colors on their face. The flag is being raised triumphantly in the air. We get the additional in, endorphins and adrenaline buzz that comes from knowing. We have a cheer squad, y'all. We got some hype people up in our corner. We, we got Conor McGregor. He had some people in his corner. We got, we got the great Irish. We got the fighting Irish all up in our, our corner, spiritually speaking. Who do we have in our corner? We have, we have Moses, the deliverer. We have Esther, the queen who saved her nation. We have Ezra, the great priest and scribe, Nehemiah, the wall builder, Anna, the prophet who lived until 84 and got to hold her savior in her arms. We have Cornelius and Barnabas and Peter and Paul. We have so many who have gone before us. Their races have been run. Their times are on the Hall of Fame board for us in the sky. We have men and women, boys and girls, who trusted Jesus and ran a good race and fought a good fight and, and saw good splits get put up on the paint. And now they, having finished the laurel wreath upon their brow, they now urge us on, don't let your life pass you by. Don't waste your life. It's precious. It's fleeting. Go fast. Be fleet. Run this. <laughs> Run this race with faith. <laughs> Keep your eyes on Jesus. Don't be tricked by the trivial. Don't live for the superficial. 
That which you can see now will soon be gone. As C.S. Lewis put it, all that is not eternal is eternally out of date. So to live only for the present with no thought to forever, in your best Sandlot voice, people of God said, forever. We must see the unseen. We must look past this little blip of a life that even if you get your 70 or 80, if you're not cut down short in the prime, as many sadly are, if you're not, you know, those who perish from the earth while still robust, if you do get 80, he's like, great, that's still. So look beyond, think further. Dig deeper, build better. And would you know that every single name on the list I mentioned a moment ago were people who benefited in their races from the discipline of fasting. We could take it much further, pointing to David and, and many others in Scripture. But so many who have gone before us have had a secret. It wasn't blood doping. It wasn't steroid injections. It was the fact that they understood to keep their eyes firmly fastened on the prize. There is a trick. There is a, a, a way that you can continually jolt yourself out of the lethargy that creeps in just living the status quo. And that is from the discipline of fasting. How is it that fasting would make us faster? Well, they don't call it slowing, you guys. <laughs> it's literally right there in front of us in the name. I want to be spiritually faster. There's a way. There's a path. There is a trick. There is a technique. And this discipline has been practiced. Now, of course, there's benefits spiritually uh, that we're going to talk about in the world at this moment, these last decade or so, has been enamored with other aspects of it, and intermittent, and the warrior fast, and 16A, and the, all, all, all sorts of benefits come from it. But what the Bible points us to is the way that fasting basically helps you, listen to me, draw closer to God. That which we want, there's a portal for it. For we all want to draw closer to God. We, not a single person among us would be like, you know what? I'm good with where I'm at. I don't want to get any closer. I don't want to do any better. At the level of, of that which I've attained, I'm fine with. I'm a pretty good mom. I'm an OK husband. I'm doing just fine. I'm scraping by spiritually Sunday to Sunday, but that's fine. I'm, I'm good here. No, we all want more. Something inside of us is insatiable. Something inside of us, there's, there's something deeper. We want. We scream for more. We cry out for more. We long for more of God. And Scripture says, by fasting and praying, we can tap into the spiritual power. Fasting, to put a fine point on it, is giving up what you want to tap into what you need. Because we want food. Our necessary food is what we want. So when we take away for a season temporarily some of what we want, we take away the richness of food, or we take away for a, for a day uh, a, a meal once a month, or, or a day once a quarter, or we take a prolonged period and we say, hey, for this, for this period, we're going to set aside a distinct time to pray and fast. We're going to do like, like Daniel did, knowing I'm up against something. I'm going to pull away richness of food and sweetness and meats and, and that which I crave. There's going to be a, a simplicity to my food so that when, when, my, when I crave rich food, when I crave savory food, when I crave the medication that comes from carbs, when I pull that aside for a season, I'm going to set my soul apart to seek after God. And the Bible promises, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Draw near to God, and bam, he will draw near to you. So we carve out space in our soul, and we watch God flood in. We make space, and we declare a fast, and we do it not just secretly alone, but corporately together. We as a church say, we want to watch God move in power. We want to become faster. We want to become stronger. We want to become more able and fit for use in the master's hand. And so because of its spiritual benefits, we choose as a church to start the year denying the flesh, 
to believe we will end the year full of the Spirit. We deny the flesh in this season, and we watch God fill it. So that's why, and I've heard it well said, that, that you don't have to look to the fast itself for the, for the benefit of it. What is a fast? Hard, <laughs> challenging, headachey, difficult, weak. Those, you, don't, you don't look to the construction to live in the penthouse. The construction is just dirty and messy and necessary. So in this season of denial, we're not looking for the benefits because we will believe for the benefits to come once the construction is done. So we're digging out, digging out, dig. How many trucks full of dirt have gone by? How many times has the neighborhood been rattled? How many, how, how many, how many more d- deposits of, of rebar can there be? It's all there. What, what more can be added? And just when we think there's, there's never going to be a benefit to it, now we're living in the new home. Now we're enjoying the, the pain of construction, the challenge and expense of a remodel. We're watching God do something new inside of our lives. I had a chance this week. It was a very unique week, sermon preparation-wise, because I, I felt led to try and find a professional race car driver to speak to. So I'm talking about fasting. I mean, you talk to someone who goes fast for a living. And so just finally, as the week ended, it all connected, and the, the wires worked out, and I received a phone call. And, and I said, uh, I need to talk to you about driving a little bit. He's like, are you interested in doing it? I'm like, not at all. Actually, I don't like driving. I want to talk to you because I'm a pastor, and I want to talk about fasting. If you go fast, and I want to go fast, so tell me about it. I said, what's the biggest thing people don't understand about fasting? He goes, oh, easy, the use of the brakes. So said, not the acceleration, not the shifting. No, and he goes, no, it's absolutely, it's all about Proper braking. Proper braking is the key to going fast. And I just said, how perfect is that? Because here we are as a, as a, as a church corporately saying, we're going to break. A fast is a break, essentially. A break from eating, a break from the routine, a break from the normal scheduled programming that is your life and consumption. And breaking going into a turn helps you to accelerate coming out of a turn. Come on, breaking helps you to be in control. Breaking helps you to find your line. Breaking uh, prevents unnecessary correcting. And then coming into the straightaway, coming into the next year, come on, we're believing as we throttle towards summer, accelerate into the autumn, there's going to be a spiritual benefit from the breaking we're doing now. A key to spiritual quickness fasting is because of the fact that it's a use of the brake pedal, an act of acceleration. When God's preparing to speed you up, first, he always slows you down. And that is why Jesus assumed, listen to me, assumed, rewind it, assumed that fasting would be a part of the warp and woof of the lives of his followers. He said in Matthew chapter 6, moreover, when you fast, he didn't say if you fast. He assumed fasting as a part of the lives of those who seek after him. So he said, moreover, say it with me, when you fast, therefore, by default, if you don't fast, you're not living as he assumed you would if you want to seek after him. That makes it pretty simple. It makes it pretty easy. Moreover, when you fast, a lot is communicated in that one word. Do not be like the hypocrites. He was talking to the professional religious people of his day. He just nicknamed them the hypocrites, right? (laughs) Not a great look. When you fast, don't be like the hypocrites. They were like in the room, okay? Jeez. With a sad countenance. Oh, man, all they're moping. Oh, look. Like God's intention isn't for your religious experience to produce a gloominess about you. That's why I'm always prodding you with joy, prodding you to not sit there with your arms folded, sitting there as though you got baptized in lemon juice. Why? Jesus wasn't into that. He wasn't into a religious experience that was glum and self-indulged and serious and focused on it. Whoa, I'm navel gazing. Whoa, oh, everything's wrong. Oh, I can't. You're doing it wrong. Oh. He's like, ah, ah, it's awful. It's awful. I can't handle it. So when you fast, don't make it a big bummer. Don't make it this big, look what you're doing for God. Look how impressed God must be with you. For all those hypocrites disfigure their faces and they walk around contorted, that they may appear to be fasting. What's wrong with you? I'm fasting. It's awful. 
That's why I said we're not going to spend these 21 days complaining that we want a Snickers. It's all about feasting on God's presence, believing for power. It's a joy. It's a delight. He's a God so good, I want to be near him. He's a God so good, I want to receive from him. It's, it's not me doing this big suffering, like God's up there going, oh, OK, eat something. Oh, OK, I'll give you what you want. Just eat something. You're, like, we're not like manipulating God. We're delighting in God. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. And what a terrible reward to have people go, wow, you're awesome. <laughs> but you, verse 17, someone say, but you, but you, when you fast, anoint your head, wash your face, put on, put on some perfume, honey, right? Like, like, like what, put, put on some clothes that make you feel good. Like, like, like it's OK. It's all right. I died for you to enjoy your life a little bit. Like it's all God. God wants to anoint your head with oil. He, he's like I heard this one sermon one time on the on the Lord's prayer, which which this pastor was like. He says, "Ask for bread." So don't you be asking for cake or steak. I just was like, that's not my God. That's not the God that I serve. He's a God of abundance and blessing. He's not bummed out if you have a little little cake at the end of the fast. Anoint your head. Wash your face. Put those jeans on that you feel amazing in. You're going to feel really good in them when the fast is over. <laughs> so that you, I haven't worn these pants in six months. I swear to God, I have lost so much weight. Don't get the flu and go on a fast. Or do, if you, it's my new diet. I'm going to advertise it to the world. We're going to infect you with sickness and then tell you to fast. And then you'll be able to wear pants you haven't worn in 2019. So that you do not appear to men to be fasting, but to your father, look at this, who is in the secret place. And your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. But, the, but again, that reward that comes from this living in the secret place, it continues to be open. That, that gift comes. That gift comes from God in his good timing. And when he's going to choose to bless us with the, re the, the results of this fast is, in his, is, his, is on his calendar, not ours. So we trust him. We walk, we walk away from this fast. If, if we didn't get a word, if we didn't get an assignment, if we didn't get a specific thing, we, we still believe that he saw it in secret. And he'll reward us when he wants to. And when he wants to, it'll be openly known. We'll watch some blessing. We'll watch some exaltation. Or we'll have peace in a storm that we might not otherwise have, or we'll have the knowledge to zig where we should have zagged and never end up in a situation needing deliverance because we never made that stupid decision, because we were spiritual minded and not carnally minded, which is death. So hypocrisy always leads to a robbing of reality and a robbing of a reward. Our hypocrisy robs of reality where there's genuineness. And what, 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 what are we looking for genuineness in? I think humility. A genuine humility. And a fast is an act of humbling ourselves to choose to take such a drastic action to say, I know I can't do this on my own. I know I need God. I know I need his strength. I know I need his power. So we go into the year humble. And the Bible promises God opposes proud people, but gives grace to the humble. And I don't know about you, but I want grace. And I need grace. And so I'm walking into this year not smug, and not self-interested, but, but saying, I, I need God's power. Yeah. I need his grace. I need his blessing. And I crave it. So when done properly, it brings you closer to God. Interestingly enough, though, it's, it's not super common. It's not really widely taught. You could go your whole Christian life and never really hear it as an emphasis. And in my life, I'm very grateful for many things. But in my spiritual upbringing, there wasn't an emphasis on what Jesus said should be a part of the lives of his followers. It wasn't uh, for me. Even, even when I began to really feel like the Holy Spirit calling me to call us as a church to, to fast regularly together and to begin the year in this way, and we sort of began with a five day, and then I think it was a week, and then we went 21 days. And, and now we're just watching God continue to give us sort of a, an understanding of it. I called a couple pastors who I knew. And one of them pastored a very large church. And I just say, hey, tell me what part fasting plays in your life. And he goes, I don't really fast. And I said, why, why not? Just out of curiosity, I'm not going to quote you on this. And I'll, of course, would never slander anybody. We're all on our own journey. It's not about legalism, right? Uh, he said, he said, I'm not really good at it, to be completely honest with you. And I go, yeah, what do you mean? He goes, well, I tried it, and I got hungry. 
And I said, with all due respect, isn't that the point? Right? Because didn't Jesus say, blessed, listen to me, are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. This is a profound truth. I want you to write it down. One of the best ways to get hungry is to be hungry. I, right? Am I just, am I, am I preaching good on a Sunday? Uh, I just think one of the best ways, if you want it, he said if you're hungry, you'll be filled. So one of the best ways to get hungry is to intentionally put yourself in a position where you feel hungry, and then you can remind yourself that not only does your body need food, not only do you crave the bread of this world, but you also have a part of you that can only eat the words that proceed from the mouth of God. So to take an intentional approach to feeling hunger, to remind yourself that there's more than one kind of hunger, it causes you to be focused. You start to hear the unseen voices of angels and priests and prophets and kings and shepherds and warriors saying, run this race. Don't look just to the world. Listen for the voice of God. Listen to the Holy Spirit. Look at Jesus, our example, our template, who himself began his public ministry by praying and fasting to bring his play, his body to a place of weakness that his soul might come to a place of strength and power in the wilderness. Five benefits. I want to help you see five benefits to fasting, a key to spiritual quickness. And the first is that it's a disruption. It's just a disruption. I read a book this a couple of years ago uh, about the power of moments, the power of moments, the Heath uh, brothers wrote it. And they talked about, in the book, how our memory is funny. When you think back to your vacation last year, when you think back to 2019 as a whole, they, you don't remember all of it. Of course, you're unable to do such a thing. But even, even the, the best, most powerful uh, memories you have essentially boil down to what they call the peak and the trough. The peak and the trough. The peak would be the highest point, and the trough would be the lowest point. So when you think back to a trip, they say in the book, to Disneyland, you will think of the one epic moment, the peak, and then you will think back to uh, a trough, a low moment, that very long line, the breakdown your child had. So you, the joy when you put the Mickey Mouse ears on them and they got on that carousel for the first time and you had just this epic nostalgic win and you channeled back your first memory and, and then the trough. The, the trough might be the bill you paid to get your family into Disneyland. The, the trough might have been the, the, your child pooping in their pants on the airplane. You're, I'm just using these for my real life examples, all right? You, you just think, you, you, you remember, no matter what it is, in terms of a peak and a trough. And so understanding this example, they, they apply going forward. But, but, I, but I wonder if you're, if you're aware that, that so much of your life is forgettable because so much of your life is just normal. So much of the last 10 years of your life, you've forgotten because it was just doing the normal. It was just the average and, and the ordinary. I don't want to live a life that's forgettable, though. And so what I want to do is take drastic action to interrupt the regularly scheduled programming that is my life. And one of the best ways to do it is something that messes with what is the bulk of your life, preparing your food, eating your food. You feel hungry, you, you eat. So when you interrupt that, you disrupt that. When you disrupt that, you create the ability to see something happen that you weren't expecting. So a fast is very effective at getting you out of a rut. Why? Because you're inviting a disruption into your life. Now, now the, the word disruption is appropriate on two levels. Because a fast is a proper thing to do when there is a disruption. Read the Old Testament. Many of the times that an enemy was coming, or there was an invasion, or there was a war. Last week, we talked about Jehoshaphat. What did he do? A war's coming? Come on, y'all, we got to fast, right? So when there is a disruption, fasting's appropriate. But when you also need an interruption, fasting is appropriate. When you realize, man, I'm just, I'm just going through the motions. I'm just on cruise control. These birthdays, they just keep flying by. And pretty soon, it's going to be decades that I'm, I'm remembering. Because when you're young, it's like, Oh, he's 18 months, 18 to 24 months. Oh, he's, 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 he's two and a half, right? And then it's like at a certain point, it's like you stop talking about months and you're not even talking about years anymore. You're like, I remember the 90s, right? It's like, oh my gosh, and, and, and life just will fly by. And pretty soon you are at the end. <laughs> Looking at your family over your toes in a hospital bed. Thinking back on your life. But you're not there yet. 
So disrupt it. Break through. Cold water on your face. Wake up and go, what am I doing? Am I doing what God's called me to do? Am I just living my life out between commercial breaks? Like, what, what is happening here? What has God called me to do here? What is the Spirit of God whispering to me? And how might I continue to dance with God by fighting to hear the music? Fasting helps you to hear heaven's music. It's a disruption. Secondly, it's an inversion. It's an inversion. How? It helps us to live inside out and not outside in. If you have the ability, turn with me to 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 23. This is a prayer that Paul prays. He says to the church at Thessalonica, may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. His prayer would be that God would help them to live inside out. And doing so, they would be prepared for the return of Jesus Christ. He mentions the three distinct parts of your personality, parts of your essence, which are as follows. Spirit, the part of you that can communicate with God, that's given to you at salvation through new birth. Then he mentions soul, the part of you that you are able to use to communicate with yourself. And then your body, the part of you that's able to communicate with your environment, using your five senses, and dialogue with other people. You have a spirit. You have a soul. You have a body. God's intention would be that you live spirit first, and you, as the basis of your interaction with God, then inform the relationship you have with yourself, which is what David did when he said to himself, hey, why are you so disquieted within me? Hope in God. He was talking to himself on the basis of his spirit. He was then telling his soul what to do. And then he would determine to, to live his body out, pleasing God in the way he interacted with his environment. God wants you to live in such a way to where you know that what you can see of me is not all there is of me. Living body first, though, is to live outside in. What we eat, what we handle, what we spend, what we wear, where we go, the trip we take. We feel like we'll be gratified if we live body first. Your body cravings, your body needs, the Bible says to live outside in is to live with your God being your belly, your appetites. Now, of course, we have sexual appetites and financial appetites and career appetites and, and all these different appetites. But to live running around only focused body first and with an afterthought of your soul and an afterthought of your spirit is to live depressed. It's to live in despair. It's to live with a crippling anxiety and always the sense that something's missing. And that's because you weren't intended to live with your God being your belly. You were intended to live with your God being Jesus. And when you get it right and you live spirit, soul, body, and we honor God, and that helps us talk to ourselves and give ourselves good advice, we then can interact with the things of this world using them instead of being used by them. And we're no longer looking for things that cannot help but disappoint us yeah. to save us. Yeah. Isaiah said, look at a guy worshiping an idol. How funny it is, really. He said, a guy chops down a tree, and he takes half the tree and makes a god. And he worships that thing and says, you are now my god. He's like, 15 minutes ago, it was an elm tree. What are you doing? He said, but it even gets funnier than that, because he takes the other half of that tree and makes a fire. And now he's cooking his dinner over the second half of his God. He's like, does he not realize the irony of the fact that his, his God is over here cooking his dinner, and the other half of him is here with eyes but cannot see, mouth but cannot speak, hands but cannot have. That is you and I when we look to things of this world to give us significance, to give us meaning. Oh, good. Oh, good. Oh, you got a golden globe. Great. Guess what? That God can't help you, can't save you. Oh, great. You bought that, that great purse you wanted, can't, can't send you to heaven or send you to hell. It's just a purse. You can't, your F-150. 50 can't help your marriage within a crisis. Let me tell you something. No matter what you do career-wise or on the ski hill or, or the sick gainer you pull, I'm just telling you, guess what? It cannot forgive you, can't help your kid when he, he gets in a car accident. Only God can do that. So use your spirit to worship God. Put your soul in proper perspective, and then your body can be used to do whatever God's called you to do as an act of worship. And you won't need any of the things that you have in this world to please you. 
You're just going to enjoy them knowing that they go back on the shelf when you go back in the box. Because the only thing you can take to heaven is your soul and your spirit. And then there will come a day when God raises your body. But all your toys and possessions, just enjoy them for what they are. But no, they're going to goodwill. Or your sister and cousin will fight over them after the funeral. But, but don't look to them to, to be your God. So fasting helps you invert what is perverted and helps us live soul, spirit, body. Does that help you? Does that clarify things a little bit? All right, third thing, uh, fasting boosts the reception. It boosts, it's like adding a, a brand new router at your house with a mesh Google transponder amplifier that's going to help you get better Wi-Fi, where you're like, ah, crap, in the bathroom, I can't go on Instagram. You know what I'm saying? Which is where everybody goes on Instagram, right? <laughs> it's like, it's like uh, adding a whole new booster that gives your house gigabit amplified streaming 4K in your soul. I'm not great with the technology, but, <laughs> but I understand reception. I understand reception issues. I understand the snow wiping out DirecTV. I understand, I understand I can't tune it in because the reception's not great. And I know that fasting helps you get better at hearing God's voice because it quiets some of the regular roar of this world. Have you ever been lost driving? What's the first thing you did when you realized you were lost? Turn down the radio. Oh my gosh, I don't know where I am. Look, quiet, you. <laughs> you turn down competing distractions when you want to focus on one thing. It's instinctive. We know that the multitasking isn't going to work here. Because whatever processing power I got up here, I need all of it right now. All of it right now. I got to quiet, 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 quiet. Why? Because you need it quiet so you can get your bearings. That's fasting. We need it quiet. because We turn down other knobs. We turn down other knobs because we desperately want to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. And it makes your soul more sensitive to his spirit's power in your life. Reception. It causes you to become mentally quick, mentally strong, less foggy, so that God won't speak to you what he said to the disciples on the road to Emmaus. Oh, you foolish, slow ones. Slow ones, he said. You are slow of heart and dull in spirit. When you live focused on the, the needs of the body only, there can be a dullness. There can be a fogginess. There can be a, a lethargy. But when you take a time and, and you set aside to, to reading scripture, and to listening to God and communicating through prayer, through gathering with his people, there's, there's just something that makes you sharper, quicker, faster. You're, you're, you're able to be strong. You're able to focus like a razor's edge. Reception is a benefit. Discipline is just a simple physical benefit. And this is where it, many other things begin to cascade and, and collide together. And so much of our spiritual life is like dominoes, where as you stack them in place, they, they play off one another. And you begin to see this acceleration. You begin to see this, this synergy. There's a discipline. Why? Because the Bible talks about us as wanting to crucify our flesh. The inside of us that's fallen, the inside of us. Now, this isn't to say the body's bad and flesh is bad. That's asceticism. This is to say there is within us still a desire and a craving to live body first, to live desire first. And so when we choose to crucify the flesh, we, we do that by taking appetite for a season and go, no, no. We are used to doing whatever our body tells us to do. I'm going to do this when I feel it. I'm going to do this when I feel it. And that's how sin holds its power over us. As Jesus' people, with our spirit awakened, we don't have to do what the flesh tells us to do, but we've just gotten really good at listening to it. We've gotten really good. Worship team, come on up here. We're almost done. We've gotten really good at saying yes. So for a period of time to say no to some physical desires, then guess what? When the fast is over and the desire for whatever else comes back in, you remind yourself, oh, I can say no. I don't have to do whatever my body says to do. And you get better at saying no because you've practiced saying no. There's a discipline to it. This is what Isaiah brings up for us in the fast uh, passage that's Isaiah 58. It's, by the way, the longest, most comprehensive passage on, in the entire Bible on fasting. When he says, is this not the fast that I have chosen? Because they were fasting unlike how God wants. I want the fast to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo heavy burdens, 
to let the oppressed go free, and that you break every yoke. There is something that's a part of fasting that's meant to lead to freedom. And the discipline aspect and the power aspect, he was talking about also social issues, issues and justice being a, a bigger theme in your life and what you care about. But it also starts inside your soul. Is this not what I want fasting to do, to break off yokes? There are things in your life that you are unable to just break off by yourself. There's demons that can't be cast out. Jesus said, except by prayer and by fasting. There's sometimes entanglements. There's sometimes strongholds in our lives, patterns of thinking we've been stuck in and trapped in. There's, there's things you just can't shake off. You're trying to run this race, but you've got heavy chains you're dragging around, wounds from the past and sins that you go to and you nurse and you allow to remain in your heart. And there's just something about a fast that will cause God's Holy Spirit to break stuff off of you, to bring you to a place of freedom so you can become quicker. Is this not what I have chosen? And that, of course, of course, ultimately leads to our fifth and final benefit, and that is preparation. I do hope you'll come next week. I really believe that God's going to continue to, to lead us as we come together. But, but preparation for what's next, preparation for what's new, preparation for what's around the river bend. Fasting sets you up for breakthrough. Fasting sets you up for blessing. Fasting sets you up. A time of, of prayer and fasting sets you up for adversity to come. For this next year will not be all roses. There will be significant setback and loss and grief in the coming years of your life. There are going to be very, very hard, unspeakable things. But to set yourself up from a place of strength is to build in you what you will need in the difficult days. These are the seven fat cows that will give you grain in your silos and wine in your wine vats for the days of famine that are coming. Come on, let's have strong souls. Let's have prepared souls. Let's have ready and able souls. Isaiah continues, is, is it not my desire to help you share your bread with the hungry that you bring to your house, the poor who are cast out? When you see naked, you want to cover him, don't you? And do not want you, don't you want to be at a place where you will not have to hide yourself from your own flesh? Oh, this is so applicable to our lives. He's saying, I want to, in fasting, do something in you and through you that will be blessing upon you so that you're positioned to be able to meet the coming needs that you're going to see in the coming days. How can you give what you don't have? How can you not use what you don't even possess? And how, why would you live at a place where you have to hide yourself from your own flesh, staying at work long to avoid time with your wife, just doing anything to be outside the house because your house is so full of strife? Why not tap into the peace and blessing so that your home would be a place of refuge for you, that it might be a place of respite to open up to others, that God would open your eyes to see need what he's done inside of you? Is this not the fast that I have chosen? Verse 8, that your light would break forth like the morning and healing shall, shall spring forth speedily. That your righteousness would go before you, the glory of God standing as your rear guard. Oh, come on, church. God wants light to break out upon you. He wants healing, not slow healing, not, not lethargic healing. He wants healing that will break forth speedily. Come on, from the blocks, around the turn. Come on, we got a break going into the new year because we're going to blaze coming out of it with the strength of the Holy Spirit at our backs, with God having prepared us for all that's in front of us all the blessing, all the adversity. Come on, he's preparing new wine, new power, new resource. And I'm going to prove it to you. In Matthew 9, Jesus had the disciples of John come to him with a question. And the question was, why do we and the Pharisees fast often, but your disciples do not fast? Now, let me ask you a question. How would they know if Jesus' disciples fasted or didn't fast? Because three chapters ago, he said, when you fast, put your best clothes on. Make sure you wash your face. You, how do you know? How do you know what's going on inside my soul? They said, how, how come your disciples don't fast? Jesus could have said, how would you know? Because I taught them how to fast properly to where they're a joy to be around, a blessing to be around. Their spirituality makes them a better friend, a better mom, a better boss. They don't walk around calling attention to themselves. They walk around being a blessing, doing what I've called them to do. Why do your disciples so not fast? He must have just smiled at them. 
Jesus said, Can the friends of the bridegroom mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, and then they will fast. And then they will fast. He said that about you. And then you will fast. I'm with them now. They don't need to fast. I'm right here. But when I go away and I'm only relating to them through my Holy Spirit and not with them physically as they will ultimately be with me in heaven, then they will fast. They will if they want me to be near to them like I want to be. Fasting makes you closer to God. If they were with him physically, they didn't need to fast, they're right there with him. But when you're not physically with Jesus, only with him spiritually, you get trapped in a, a cycle of living where your body is louder than your spirit is. So they will fast if they want to be near me like my disciples are currently near me. Why should you fast? Why? Because Jesus is in heaven. He's with us through his Holy Spirit. But we want to be near to him. We want to be eternally focused. We want to be quick spiritually. Then they will fast. Will we fast? We're doing it right now, God. God, because we want to be near you we want to seek you we want to see you and we want to be ready for what you're doing and what is he doing verse 16 no one puts a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment for the patch will pull away from the garment and the tear will be made worse nor do they put new wine into old wine skins or the wine skins will break it won't handle what I'm doing it won't handle what's fermenting it won't handle what's cooking the wine is spilled and the wine skins get ruined they will put new wine into new wine skins and both will be preserved and it will be the best wine anyone's ever tasted and that fresh life church is what God is doing inside of us he's preparing some new wine skins because in the coming new, new year he's preparing some new wine inside of us but he can't get his new wine ready if you don't get your soul ready to hold it and ready to handle it